So cooperative play in Splinter Cell Conviction is really kind of defined by two main sections. There's first is the prologue, which is our story campaign. It's co-op with a story. Uh, it represents four missions that take place uh, before the events of the single player game. So it's actually kind of a prequel. And we have these two player characters, Archer and Kestrel. Archer's an American working for Third Echelon, Sam's old employers. Kestrel's a Russian agent working for Voron. Uh, and these two guys have to team up for political reasons, uh, get over their kind of mutual distrust, and, and get to the heart of this conspiracy to smuggle EMP weapons into the US. The other part of what we have is what we're calling Deniable Ops. And Deniable Ops are these four additional game modes that players can play in the four story mode maps plus two maps that are exclusive to those modes. No one noticed Kurtzikov setting up his clubhouse when he in Moscow. There's going to be some elements that people will see that, that will be familiar to them, especially if they play split screen and they're familiar with the Chaos Theory co-op mode. But I think that uh, a big part of it, what we're trying to bring is this idea that you know you can have a story in co-op with distinct characters that have a kind of relationship between the two player characters. Um, the other part of it is that this is a much more dynamic style of stealth gameplay, which means that players have the freedom to get into trouble and then get out of trouble. In other words, the freedom to get themselves into a bit of a mess, kind of use the various tricks and tools at their disposal to get out of that trouble and disappear. One thing at a time. Come on, you. Faster, faster. Definitely the level design in the co-op maps is a little more open and it reflects the fact that we could have two player characters that are both kind of these elite agents that are both running around in the same kind of space at the same time. In terms of a more emergent style of gameplay, that really comes down to our AI, which is extremely systemic. Um, as much as possible, you know, we don't have kind of hand-placed enemies that are always in the same spot every time you play through it. Especially in Deniable Ops, there's a fair amount of randomness to where you're going to run into enemies, which means the replay value is actually pretty good. As Third Echelon agents and Voron agents, Archer and Kestrel have kind of like their, their basic default equipment set up, which they can use at the start of the game. However, all of the weapons that you encounter, either in single player or in the co-op storyline, um, become kind of part of your persistent armory. So every time you encounter a weapon stash, or every time you enter the locker room, kind of in the main menu of the game, you're able to go in and pick weapons that you've encountered at various points in both single player and in co-op. You're then able to upgrade those weapons persistently uh, using those pick points. You can also upgrade your uh, overall armor setup, your, the capacity for carrying ammunition and gadgets as well. In terms of trying to reward the more elite players, the more advanced players, um, what we really wanted to do was sort of say, you know, reward those players that are being extra well coordinated in terms of how they play together, reward the players that are taking the time to synchronize their actions by kind of uh, unpeeling different onion skins to the different mechanics of the game. So to give you an example, you know, people know about the mark and execute system from single player, the exact same system, the exact same controls are there for you in co-op. You know, the difference is just when you have two players that are able to mark enemies, they can share their marks. That's kind of the first layer of it. The next layer of it is once players start to synchronize themselves a bit better, they can move into tactical positions where they're able to simultaneously take out a larger number of enemies in a bigger area. So we have four modes in Deniable Ops. Um, the first that people are aware of probably is Hunter Mode. Uh, hunter Mode is really uh, about going into a particular zone and eliminating the enemies that are in that zone, ideally without them realizing what hit them. If you do get detected, it means they call in reinforcements and suddenly you can find yourself up against twice as many guys that are searching for you. Last Stand is kind of a survival mode where you basically have to protect an EMP warhead that has a limited amount of hit points. Uh, and we have waves of enemies that are coming into the map that are really out to destroy that warhead. And they, they're getting harder with each wave. We have an adversary mode called face off. It's spy versus spy, but with the added kind of strategic element of having hostile enemies in the map if the players choose. We also have our, our you play unlockable mode. It's also available in our collector's edition. That's infiltration mode. Uh, infiltration is kind of our homage to old school purist stealth gameplay um, where you have security systems, you have enemies that you need to overcome, and if you get detected at any time when you're moving from point A to point B, that's it. It's game over. The bullet over the fuse these rail cars to flee Moscow in the event of atomic war. So in the Persistent Elite Creation System, we have different families or classes of challenges that you can complete. When you've got them all done, you know, then you're earning a certain number of peck points. Splinter Cell Conviction will be out in the, in, across North America on April the 13th, and I think two days later worldwide. Uh, it'll be available for Xbox 360 and for the PC.